uh, I'm going to talk to you uh, about my own experiences on things which I have worked. Uh, they are things which are actually far away from a Mumbai-like place. Much of my professional life, which is which has not been that long actually, I don't want to feel old, uh, has been largely dedicated to villages, the villages of India, where 70% uh, of population lives, where we get so many resources which we consume here, not even wondering where they have originated from. I'm going to talk to you about uh, three segments. The first one, we'll talk about why should we focus on rural India? Easy one, actually. The second is uh, something which we have worked with. I had the privilege to work with Dr. Kalam on a concept called Pura, providing urban amenities in rural areas, which also took the shape of the book Target 3 Billion. And the third segment, I just want to recap, not what I've done, but what you are doing. Right, I hope this works. Right, so this was the book. Somebody's trying to sell it on OLX, as you can see. I'm not very happy about it. But uh, this is the book. And uh, let me begin with this. If you leave Sub-Sahara, Sub-Sahara is, uh, I can't move from here, but this one, right, where the red circle is. If you move out of Sub-Sahara and ignore all those countries, there are 15 countries in the world which have a GDP per capita less than India. 15 countries. So here's a list of 16 countries, India plus 15 countries. So India and all countries which have less than uh, GDP per capita, less than India. And I've marked them uh, for your convenience in uh, green. There's a small country called Haiti there, uh, which is barely visible. Now let's see. This is the list, and I promise you this is the only slide with numbers on it. And I don't want you to read the numbers, I'll tell you what to read. If you look at the first column, GDP per capita, India is at the top in this list of 16 countries, which is very good, and Afghanistan is at the bottom. Something to be feel good about? Maybe, maybe not. But discover further, has this economic growth actually translated into a better life for the people? So what I did was that we've taken a few parameters which are very critical to any society, uh, fertility rate, life expectancy at birth, literacy, infant mortality, under five mortality, uh, things like stunted growth and underweight. And let's look at the rank of India along all these parameters within this list of 16. India is ranked 7th in total fertility rate. India is ranked 10th in female literacy and infant mortality rate. India is ranked 11th in mean years of schooling. India is ranked 13th in stunted children and access to sanitation. And India ranks last in underweight children. 43% Indian children are still underweight. My question is, has our economic growth, has the GDP per capita rise over the past 10, 15, 20 years, whatever time frame we can put it, has it translated into some kind of social growth? Of course, there have been sub-growth, but this is not enough. And why is this happening? It's because, and my theory is, that large uh, a large portion of our investment, a large portion of our GDP, a large portion of our thrust has been in urban areas. While the rural segment, which is 70% of our population, is where these poor social parameters are coming from. And that's why the model of Pura. Pura stands for Providing Urban Amenities in Rural Areas, P-U-R-A. It became a national policy in, uh, in actually 2002, but then it came out as a department itself within MORD, Ministry of Rural Development, in 2005, a lot of private sector entrepreneurs, a lot of NGOs, and the government, the previous and the current, have been pursuing the model. And uh, now Pura has been re-Christianed as Rurban, Rural Urban. Where do I find? Yeah. Now, villages of India. Some of you belong to a generation of this man, right? Where this is Shole, the legendary movie of Shole. And if you can recognize this man, this is Gabbar Singh. Gabbar Singh lives in this village called Ramgarh and what Gabbar Singh does is that at any given moment of time at his own free will rocks into Ramgarh, takes away whatever he wants and nobody can do anything about it till two superheroes of Indian cinema have to save that village. This is our perception. Cinema reflects the perception of a society about a particular asset. This is what 1980s villages, people thought villages would be. Anarchist, ridden with crime and really nothing much to do. And then, flash forward to some of 
the other half of the crowd's generation movie, Champaran. Champaran, where Amir Khan leads a bunch of almost suicidal people who take up the challenge of contesting with the British on a cricket match, which they have no clue of because they cannot pay a doguna lagan. They take the ultimate risk because they cannot pay double the taxation even for once. Fortunately, there's Amir Khan who bats really well and it pays off. But again, our perception of villages has not changed in a matter of about 15 years separating these two movies. It's same, anarchist, no economic activity, very little to do and would take any risk to circumvent you know, a minor increase in taxes or, or in this case, um, uh, a goon like uh, Gabbar Singh. This is the perception of our villages which needs to change. Now, uh, all of you are professionals, some of you are MBA students. One great quality is to observe. And this is a picture which is, I've, I've taken this in a place called Loni. Loni is in Maharashtra, in uh, actually near Shirdi. And here's a picture, it's from a camera phone, so pardon the quality of the picture, but look at the content. Now, I want you to observe a few things on this picture. First, observe the farmer who's wearing a Gandhian topi. Gandhian topi is very symbolic. Observe there's a plow, hull, you know, the wooden thing, uh, which is, well, probably 18th century technology. Observe the fact that the plow is being pulled by two women. Observe the fact that one of those women is in a school uniform. Observe, and if you really can observe, observe that the man is wearing shoes and the woman are bare feet. This picture to me summarizes social inequity and economic activity in villages. Where's the technology? Where is the equality? Where is the schooling? When I went to this man's hut, which is right, you know, right hand side of the picture, a small, you know, this one, okay, this doesn't work. Okay, uh, this hut, he, they're very hospitable people and, and they serve you something which they call as uh, kala sharbat, which is basically a black, black syrup, uh, which is nothing but cola. Cola can reach this man's kitchen every day. Technology cannot, schooling cannot reach his girl. Shoes cannot reach the women. What, what lessons in development we can derive from the corporate world is a question. And with that, I want to tell you some brighter side of the picture. This girl, uh, I'm going to now talk to you about the model of Pura. This girl is called Samosi. Now, if you are aware, uh, it's very easy to guess what is her favorite snack. Right. Samosi is a, is a seven-year-old girl seven year old in 2012 when I met her. Samosi is an orphan and Samosi wants to be a musician. So, uh, there's this place called Kalkeri Sangeet Vidyale. It's in Northern Karnataka in a place called Dharwad. If you're aware of Northern Karnataka, there's a small place called Dharwad. It's fairly tribal, it's slightly hilly. And amongst these tribals, there's a, there's a bunch of uh, people led by a person called Matthew. Uh, Matthew is a, is a French national who came to India and went to Banaras and then did not leave India. Banaras has that effect on people and uh, dedicated his life to Hindustani classical music in 1991. And since then he's opened this uh, Kalkeri Sangeet Vidyale in Northern Karnataka and his job is that he looks at children who are underprivileged, who have a musical talent, singing, music, anything and takes them and runs and takes them to this free uh, school which transforms into a musical academy in the evening and there are about uh, 150 to 200 such children who are identified from all over northern Karnataka and being trained to be the perhaps the next A.R. Rahman. Samosi plays violin, beautiful violin, seven year old girl, very difficult to hold a violin for a seven year old girl, it's almost half her height, in fact more and Samosi's, Animartis and Barfis of that world are playing beautiful music and they learn it by a simple technology called Skype because this is at the top of a mountain. In case you want to train them, uh, there are voluntary sessions where people can be connected from places like this hall to hills where Samosi lives and with, with a, a Skype connectivity, you can train them in anything which you want or anything which you're good at. They're pretty good at themselves, a lot of stuff. So this is how electronic connectivity is making Samosis and Imartis and Barfis of this world become great musicians. That's how you reach out. This is the first level of connectivity for Pura. 
Then this person is called Ramavatar. This is a photograph from a place called Chitrakoot. Chitrakoot is in, uh, well, it's on the border of uh, Uttar Pradesh and Madhya Pradesh. And Chitrakoot is, uh, has a lot of religious significance as well. But not getting at that, uh, Ramavatar is one well, of the typical farmers of India. One and a half to two acres of land and uh, struggling to meet two ends. Uh, now, what these people did was that they did an experiment. There's an there's a, uh, organization called DRI. Deen Dayal Research Institute, which basically operates this Chitrakoot Pura across 500 villages. And across these 500 villages, they try to teach people on how to do good farming. But nobody would take it up because it's too risky. Nobody wants to be told a formula which they don't see themselves. So they decided to do something. They took out land of one and a half and two and a half acres, which is the typical size which a farmer would own. And then they would do something like an internship program. So you have a three month internship in innovative farming at this model farm and this model farm will tell you for a family size of five or six what are the kind of things which you can grow and what is the kind of revenue which you will earn and how will you meet your expenses so it's not just farming it's about teaching them life skills how to live with a farm and that has been a very positive mood uh, and all these 500 villages now send people to intern in these model farms and uh, ha there has been a huge technological imbibition in um, in this way so this is how knowledge connectivity is helping the Ramavtars of this world uh, learn better farming. Uh, what has happened as a consequence of this is that this guy, uh, at least few of them have become innovative farmers and within their farms, uh, they have set up their own innovation farms. Uh, this one is the best story. Uh, this is again in Maharashtra. This is in a place called uh, uh, Loni. So this is similar to the first photo I showed, the same place, Loni. And these two girls, uh, they're called Sarita and Vinita. Let's name them uh, Sarita and Vinita for now. Uh, let's call the pink one as Sarita. Let's call the yellow one as Vinita. Uh, so here's a bit of a story behind them. Uh, we were going into the Lonipura. Lonipura is uh, affects about 80 villages it covers uh, in the area of Loni, operated by a medical university. Uh, I was going there and then uh, this, this woman comes up, must be... 17, 18 years of age, and she says, I've got something brilliant to show you, and I run it. I'm the entrepreneur. I said, fine, let's go. I go with this little girl, 17 years old, and we come across this center, which is basically making food processing, papad and similar stuff, which local women can make. But there's a catch to it. All these women who run this center are tribal women uh, who were married, and in tribal areas of Loni, the custom is that when you're 12, uh, people start looking for marriage. And in this case, uh, they, these, all these women at the age of 12, 13 were married to people living on the plains who had better wealth and who were thrice their age. You know, 40 year old man marrying a 12 year old woman, 13 year old girl. And then uh, what happened is that all of these guys uh, were uh, truck drivers and India is, we all know that truck drivers is a high incidence of HIV. These girls acquired HIV from their husband as their second, third wives. The husbands passed away in a while and all these women at the age of 16, 17, 15 perhaps were left on the streets with the children with them, sometimes the children inside them and there was no support mechanism and that's when the Lonipura, the Pravara Medical University which runs them, they got them together and they asked them to set up this economic center. All these women were HIV positive. Many of the children are also HIV positive. Sarita and Vinita are one of those children. You know, they're two of those children. They are sisters. I asked them, what do you want to become? And this little chatterbox, you know, the pink one, she said that I want to become a doctor. I want to become a doctor because all my life I have seen my mother sick and I want to cure her. At that level, compassion is commendable. I don't know whether she becomes a doctor or not. I wish she does, but a brilliant compassion. But that's how women got together doing an economic activity leads to a change at a rural area. About 80 villages are being benefited like this. So this is Pura model for you. It talks about physical connectivity, of course, which is roads. But beyond that, electronic connectivity, knowledge connectivity, and economic connectivity. OK. Now I am kind of running out of time. We've got three minutes, and I want to finish on time. And I wanted to, the last segment of my talk, I wanted to focus on what you've been doing not what I've been doing. And you've been spending listening to this man, I don't know whether you're interesting or not, for the past 
16 minutes. 16 minutes you've spent here. What happened in the 16 minutes? I want to just capture that. How the world is changing. In 16 minutes, how the world has changed and what we can do about it. In 16 minutes, the rich nations of this world would have given about $5.5 million in aid to the poor countries of this world. <coughs> Phenomenal. But the poor countries of this world would have given $55 million back as repayments, interest and debts. Money would have moved, about $50 million would have moved from the poorest countries of this world to the richest countries of this world. In about 16 minutes, 5,000 children would have been born all across the world, not just India, we're talking about globally. About 2,100 people would have died and the population would have gone up by 2,900 people. While we were listening, while you were listening, 1.33 million kilograms of carbon dioxide would have been added by all kinds of human activities, vehicles, agriculture, industry, power generation. Now to offset this 1.33 million kilograms of carbon dioxide, we should have planted about 60,000 trees worldwide. But what we have ended doing is that we have reduced them by 8,000. 8,000 trees would have been cut when we needed to plant 60,000. In about now 17 minutes, India would have spent about 80 lakh rupees, given the current budget, 80 lakh rupees on its top-notch agricultural research institute, ICAAR basically, Delhi-based institute, the government's top-notch agricultural research. 18 lakh rupees, phenomenal. But at the same time, people would have played farm bill all over the world and spent almost half of that amount, more than half of that amount, on buying electronic seeds and electronic tractors and electronic fertilizers. Do you remember this person? Candy Crush. 90,000 users in the past 17 and a half minutes would have played and crossed one level of Candy Crush. 90,000 users playing candies, virtual candies. At the same time, 456 Indian children would have been permanently stunted due to malnutrition. And just above the line, 15 million new glasses of cola drink would have been served all around the world. A quarter of them would be in third world countries and emerging economies like us, glasses. And without glasses, 20 children would have gone permanently blind. 12 of them will die within this year. And one third of them, four of them, will die in Cambodia, Afghanistan, by, spending, by stepping on landmines. Where are our priorities? This is the last section of my talk. This is the last lines of my talk, actually. Our priorities have to be readjusted. The book Target 3 Billion was about adjusting priorities. It's not bad to flay farm well. It's not bad to have a cola drink. But it's also important to look where those, the first slide I showed, where India is lagging in its parameters, where do children die? 61 children in India die, out of 1,000 children will die at, as an infant, infant mortality rate. 61 children out of 1,000 will die. These should be our priorities, perhaps. It's time to readjust our priorities. I wish you all do it. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you.